The Republic of Zimbabwe, even as African countries go, is a mess. Hyperinflation, tribal wars, brain drain, a cult leader as president, these are only some of the problems which it has faced in the last 40 years. It ranks among the poorest countries in the world, among the most corrupt, and its economic outlook remains pessimistic. A song written by an emigre, John Edmund, connects the state of his former home with the famous Zimbabwe ruins, a great walled structure built perhaps a thousand years ago in the namesake of the Republic. Edmund was a citizen of the preceding state, the Republic of Rhodesia. Rhodesia is a byword of edgy right-wing internet posters, and there is a spectrum of how much its controversial aspects are either ignored or justified. As a brief introduction to these aspects, let us say that Rhodesia was not founded on the idea of racial equality. Nevertheless, because of its focus on private property rights, it was a well-developed high-income country, rare for the continent of Africa. The Great Zimbabwe, located in modern-day Masvingo province, had probably been built by an advanced Shona kingdom in the Middle Ages, and its abandonment had been followed by a succession of other Shona dynasties that continued the main economic folkways of their people, cattle farming and exploitation of the vast gold mines that littered the region, trading mainly with Portuguese and Arab merchants who had established themselves on the eastern and western coastlines of southern Africa. Their descendants make up the vast majority of the population of modern Zimbabwe. However, by the mid-19th century, the Shona were living under the rule of dissident Zulu warlords who had fled from the south, called the Indabele. The region had long been known for its gold, but something even more precious had been discovered in Africa that would change this arrangement forever. Diamonds. In 1866, the first diamond scene in Africa was found in the Northern Cape, and this unleashed a frenzied search for more deposits all over the area. Cecil Rhodes, a brilliant businessman but even more cunning politician, cut his teeth in the South African diamond world, founding the world-famous De Beers Mining Company. This gave him great wealth, and instead of using his business acumen for the betterment of mankind by continuing to increase the productivity of his industry, and cut costs to the common man, Rhodes sought out political power, which he started to get with office in 1880, and by 1888 was after more than a simple parliamentary seat in Cape Colony, but to control his own personal kingdom. He set his sights on Matabele land, the name of the Indabele state. Rhodes was given a charter to form the British South Africa Company, complete with its own police force, in all senses but formally a state in itself. This state declared war against the Indabele king Lobengula in 1893 and quickly defeated them. Despite the martial prowess of the Indabele, the old children's rhyme goes, Whatever happens, we have got the maximum gun, and they have not. An uprising three years later was savagely crushed by the British South Africa police, which was later termed the First Chimaranga, or Uprising, a term that will come up later. By 1895, the territory seized by Rhodes's goons was referred to as Southern Rhodesia, and white prospectors flooded in from South Africa and the United Kingdom to make their fortune in gold and diamond mining in the following decades. Although, as it happened, tobacco ended up being the prominent export of Southern Rhodesia. As white settlers continued to flow into Southern Rhodesia, they quickly started seizing land from the native blacks, who used it for subsistence agriculture. Tribal lands shrank at an alarming rate before the Land Act of 1930 at least put an upper limit on white land at 50%, with Africans being guaranteed a paltry 30% of the land that could not be bought by white-owned companies or farmers. The disproportionate divvying up of the land by fiat, first by the British South Africa Company before it was replaced by a British colonial government in 1924, turned many black Rhodesians against the government and white settlement in general. Robert Gabriel Mugabe was born in 1924 and was educated by Catholic priests, becoming a schoolteacher who largely kept his nose out of politics as a young man. His radicalization occurred not when he was reading the works of Marx and Engels, which lambasted the idea that men who organize a society's productive means should benefit from it, but when he visited the newly independent black nation of Ghana for further education in 1958. The man who engineered Ghana's independence, Kwame Nkrumah, would be a prefiguration of Mugabe himself, creating a personality cult and cracking down on any dissent before his own fall from grace. 
When Mugabe returned to southern Rhodesia in 1960, there was already a simmering African nationalist movement afoot. And somewhat serendipitously, Mugabe came to speak at a large rally being held by the nationalists right before a huge crackdown on sedition by the Rhodesian government basically made all public debate and assembly subject to censor and indefinite detention, outraging even colonial judges. Quote, This bill outrages every basic right if passed into law. It will remove the last vestige of doubt about whether Rhodesia is a police state. Sir Robert Tregold. Mugabe and his wife Sally were placed under house arrest for their activism, and they were both able to sneak out of the country to African rule Tanganyika in 1962. By this time, Mugabe had dismissed the idea that an increasingly authoritarian white ruler southern Rhodesia could be reasoned with, and he founded the Zimbabwe African National Union, which had at its core the idea of armed struggle. Having returned to Rhodesia in 1964, he was captured and sentenced to a long prison sentence, where he had much time to think and plan his next move against the colonial powers. Southern Rhodesia, though a small colony in terms of its white settlers, was an exceptionally large producer of both staple crops, mostly corn, and export goods like cotton and tobacco, becoming known as the breadbasket of Africa. Though the way that the white farmer and industrial class had come into this land was dubious at best, the internal market of Rhodesia was open. Competition was promoted by the ruling colonial government, and it quickly gained a reputation of punching above its weight. Nowhere was this reputation more appreciated than its contribution to the British war efforts in the First and Second World Wars. Forty percent of white men in the colony served in the armed forces between 1914 and 1918, and about five percent of them died in service. This tradition was followed in 1939 with the outbreak of the Second War, topping the proportional contribution even more than the famous New Zealanders. This martial service was thought to have gained for southern Rhodesia a privileged place among the colonies in the heart of their mother country. This illusion was to be shattered soon after the cessation of hostilities in 1945. In 1953, the British created a sort of transitional federation between self-governing southern Rhodesia and the protectorates of northern Rhodesia and Nyasa land, with the idea of creating independent, black-ruled countries out of them. In the other two colonies, with lower numbers of whites, this was undertaken with little resistance, but in southern Rhodesia, there was significant political pushback, and by the time the federation was dissolved in 1963, northern Rhodesia had become Zambia, Nyasaland had become Malawi, but southern Rhodesia had become Rhodesia, a colony in limbo that created a headache for the British government in its quest for decolonization. Ian Smith, newly minted Prime Minister of Southern Rhodesia, was in negotiations with the British government over Rhodesia becoming an independent dominion, like Australia or Canada, within the British Commonwealth of Nations. According to him, however, this process ground to a halt with the change in government in London from a supportive conservative government to an antagonistic Labour one under Harold Wilson in late 1964. Wilson refused anything less than a guarantee of immediate majority black rule in Rhodesia, which made Smith and the other white voters who overwhelmingly supported him balk. On November 11, 1965, a deliberate nod to Rhodesian pride at its outsized contributions to the world wars, a unilateral declaration of independence was made, fully cutting Rhodesia off from the Commonwealth, Britain, and the monarchy. The Republic of Rhodesia joined the ranks of the unrecognized states and the black nationalists with no prospect of an internationally brokered settlement, began to use open violence against the new state in a second Chimaranga. The war, instigated by those Zanu and Zapu, Joshua Nkomo's outfit that rivaled Mugabe's, who were still at large, was initially one-sided. Operating from bases in Zambia and rebel camps in Portuguese Mozambique, they were no match for the well-trained and armed Rhodesian army even while they quickly were banned from importing weapons and had to make do with their own. As the years marched on, however, Portugal was overthrown by a socialist-led revolution in 1974, bringing the new African nationalist government in Maputo on the side of the rebels. Mugabe and Nkomo, too, were released that year under international pressure, and they went quickly to work organizing the guerrilla war with their respective forces. 
The Rhodesian forces were still tactically supreme, never losing a single engagement against the communist bloc trained and equipped national forces, but crippling sanctions on basic war material like ammunition, gunpowder, oil, and steel forced Ian Smith into negotiations to form a transitional state called Zimbabwe Rhodesia in 1978. This government was tasked with organizing a new constitution which would gradually give full political power to the black majority after 10 years. An election was organized for early 1980. Whites were extremely apprehensive about a Mugabe win, and the British apprehensive about a three-way civil war between ZANU, ZAPU, and whites. However, Mugabe seemed to defy expectations, for while the election was clearly unfair and rife with intimidation of the ZAPU, Mugabe quickly switched to conciliatory language, invited whites into the cabinet, and kept the Rhodesian army chief of staff. The economic outlook in the early years was encouraging as well. With two bumper crops in a row, white farmers were even starting to warm up to Bob, while the white opposition still had veto power over the more radical proposals of the majority, and the relief of sanctions supercharged the stock market. This honeymoon was not to last, even during the 10 years of transition. The election of 1985, set against a rise in racial tensions, represented a backslide in political relations. Ian Smith, the symbol of white rule, topped the white roles in the last election with separate electoral roles. In response, Mugabe attacked the majority of whites as racist and demanded they be eliminated. ZANU, Mugabe's outfit, were Maoists, trained for a guerrilla's people's war. They were Shona speakers, in contrast with the mostly sindabele speaking Zapu of Mugabe's one-time ally, now rival, Nakomo. Nakomo was never as doctrinaire a Marxist as Mugabe, neither in his military organization nor in his political solutions. At the same time, the whites were shifting uncomfortably under the breakdown in civil society, Zapu leadership was apprehensive about Mugabe's open desire to form a single-party state. The result was a series of clashes, quickly becoming one-sided massacres between the ZANU and ZAPU loyalists, called the Gukura Hundi. Thousands of people, including whole villages ethnically aligned with the ZAPU, were slaughtered, and Mugabe blackbirded the remnants of ZAPU into a new united party called ZANU-PF, completing his autocratic ambitions. The demands of black Zimbabweans generally, but disgruntled ZANU veterans in particular, caused Mugabe to declare a third Chimarenga, the final end to the century of humiliation by the colonialists, and laid out a plan to nationalize about 45% of commercial property, almost all owned by white farmers. Ignoring the outrages of the Zimbabwe Supreme Court, the United Kingdom, the IMF, and the business community of Zimbabwe, this plan was implemented with waves of ZANU veterans, often young unemployed men driven to the site by army trucks, claiming farmers' land for themselves and daring the farmers to do anything about it. This abrogation of private property rights sent the Zimbabwe stock market into a tailspin, and the pullout of foreign aid only added fuel to the fire. On November 14, 1997 alone, Black Friday, the Zimbabwean dollar lost 75% of its value against the USD. This was only a portent of what was to come, as the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe engaged in a massive borrowing campaign for years, hoping to paper over the vast government deficits the Mugabe regime was producing. By 2003, the RBZ could no longer buy the ink and paper necessary to print the increasingly ridiculous amounts of fiat currency it needed for this project, and it changed tack, slamming the market with an interest rate that reached 5,200% by spring 2004. This did temporarily slow inflation, although the pain to the Zimbabwean consumer was enormous, a life-threatening hangover after years of profligate spending. During all of this, of course, the primary culprit, according to President Mugabe, was the white farmers, secretly colluding with foreign powers to undermine the great socialist experiment. In 2008, with voters ready to throw him out after 28 years on the throne, he unleashed such a wave of voter intimidation, suppression, and outright violence that despite coming well short of victory in the first round of the presidential election against the moderate MDC candidate Svangarai, his opponent dropped out of the race and allowed Mugabe to cruise to victory. 
By the end of the year, inflation, having crept back up through the black market, peaked at about 500 billion percent before the RBZ relented and allowed foreign currency to be used for financial transactions. In the midst of this financial crisis, the collectivization that caused it also led to mass mismanagement of the once extremely productive farmland in Zimbabwe, crashing exports and creating the need for imports of staple crops for the first time. Mugabe, internationally isolated but still firmly in power through his iron fist, hung on until his beloved ZANU-PF army toppled him in 2017. Despite being taken out of power, Mugabe was able to spend his last years in comfort, and his death was followed by a lavish state funeral. His crimes were never punished. Emerson Manangangwa, his former vice president and successor, did at least reverse some of his more disastrous decisions, inviting white farmers back to the country and promising them compensation for their stolen land. Many have taken him up on this offer, but Zimbabwe's future is far from certain at this time. Rhodesia, for all its faults, did not punish the productive. This allowed it to survive brutal sanctions. Zimbabwe, for all its claims of racial justice, was a worse country to live in for everyone. The Western world that claimed to defend private property rights and oppose central planning were its undertakers. What possessed them to abandon a bulwark against anti-communism during the heart of the Cold War? Almost certainly guilt for colonialism. It is true that Rhodesia was nothing if not a child of imperialism, and it has the sins of any number of projects that ignored native rights for the sake of development. Zimbabwe's lesson, though, is that imperialism cannot be replaced with another form of centralization, and indeed, that the full imperialism of Marxist-Leninism is far more horrific than Cecil Rhodes' pink map. <laughs>